Hello, everybody. Welcome to Momovation TV. My name is Leah Segedy, creator of Momovation and author of Green Enough that just came out in late March. We have a very special show here. We're doing something amazing right now. The Momovation community has gathered together to talk about receipt paper. Now, I know a lot of you may be wondering why we're talking about receipt paper, what's so sexy about receipt paper, and what is going on? Well, I wanted to tell you that receipt paper, even though you don't think about it, you just sign it and go on with your life, is actually something that you should be considering because it could be impacting your health. And who I've brought on today is a really special guest. Now, before I um, introduce him, I wanted to tell you guys that if you go right now um, to Care2, there is a petition that has gotten over 14 thousand signatures and it's our community that has started this our community that has brought this all together to say to target that we want them to change the coding on their receipt paper we want them to change their receipt paper and we want them to offer us digital receipts or no receipts and that is to protect their customers from bisphenols now bisphenols is a subject that we've been discussing here in momovation and i discuss in my book quite frequently but this is something that's a major contributor of bisphenols to your system. So what I want to do is introduce you to my main scientific advisor and very close personal friend, Pete Myers. He's amazing. He's the chief scientist of environmental health sciences. He's been with me for, oh, I don't know, two, maybe three years now. Um, I go to him with a lot of my questions. He's one of the fathers of endocrine disruption science. It's I think about 30 years old coming on next year. And I wanted to introduce him and give him a second to kind of tell you guys about himself and maybe a little bit of the beginnings of this science. Then we're going to launch into the petition, talk about bisphenols and talk about how thermal receipt paper specifically at Target could be impacting your health and what you can do about it. Hey, Pete, thank you so much for coming on. Hi, Leah. It's great to be here. What a delight. And I think this issue you're working on is very important for people's health. Everyone's saying hi to you in the, in the comments section. Can you tell everybody a little bit about um, your background and maybe the start of how endocrine disrupting chemicals and hormone disruption and the understanding of the science started? Sure, so my background, I have a PhD in biology from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, I got that in 1979. I began to work seriously on endocrine disruption in the late 1980s. And in 1991 was the co-organizer along with Theo Colborn at the seminal workshop for the field in 1991 at Wingspread in Racine, Wisconsin. And, and it was there that, that I offered the group, uh, about 25 scientists from all over the world, uh, I suggested that we should be calling what is now known as endocrine disruption, I suggested we call it endocrine disruption, and, and the name stuck. Uh, I have been working on this uh, for a long time, in fact, ever since then. In 1996, Theo and I published Our Stolen Future along with Diane Dumanoski. It was the first major book, uh, uh, first public book for the public that uh, dove deeply into endocrine disruption. Uh, it was a bestseller in the US and in Japan. Um, and actually, I'm delighted to say that it's still for sale. It's used in university classes around the world, translated into 16 languages. So um, I do a bunch of things in this issue. I help scientists figure out uh, how to work together. We've published a number of major papers uh, with me chairing literally hundreds of conference calls with those scientists. And um, I also am engaged right now in primary research on bisphenol A. So, so you've done, um, yeah, you've done an incredible amount of research on BPA. Can you tell the audience a little bit about what you've discovered over the years with BPA and BPS? Well, most of the discoveries are not mine, in fact. They're, they're the community of academic and university scientists who work on bisphenol A and other endocrine disrupting compounds. Um, the work that I have been doing recently is not yet published, and I can't 
talk about it, but it's going to knock some socks off when it comes out. Um, so uh, bisphenol A, um, a simple molecule that's used in a wide array of, of consumer products, um, is the, the, the basic building block of polycarbonate plastic. And also it's used as a developer, and I'll explain what that means, used as a developer coated as dust on the paper of, of uh, thermal receipts. That is the type of receipts that come out of your um, ATM machine or out of the, the gas station pump, et, et cetera. BPA as a developer is a monomer. It's, a, it, it's coated in there literally as dust. Um, and when you handle the BPA paper, it comes off onto your skin. Um, it, uh, you can absorb it, and Fred von Saul of the University of Missouri has done some elegant experiments showing that uh, the amount that you absorb after handling BPA is enough to raise levels in your blood to be problematic. And he, um, and, and, and so here's, here's the thing about thermal receipt paper. You got, as that paper comes out of the printer, it, there's not ink being printed onto the paper. Instead, what happens is there are tiny do, uh, uh, drops of dye embedded inside the paper and little needles hit the paper as it's coming out and form the letters by puncturing those little microcapsules of dye, letting the dye, which inside the capsule is clear, letting it leach out onto the surface where it combines with bisphenol A and turns dark. Uh, when we first started to work on this, most uh, paper receipts that we sampled uh, were uh, BPA based, but we noticed that uh, almost that, that quite a few of them were done with something else. And we were really pleased when we discovered that because it indicated that, that there was a commercially viable alternative in the market being used by some types of sound manufacturers of thermal receipt paper. Then we asked the obvious question, well, what is it? Turns out it was BPS, uh, vanishingly, tinily different from BPA, uh, but something that chemical manufacturers can legitimately call BPA free, which is <laughs> taken to doing. Um, so it, at the time there were well over a thousand uh, papers studying the toxicology of BPA, uh, indicating that it was harmful at low doses. Uh, there were a few studies from industry uh, that uh, didn't find anything. Um, Obviously. But, yeah. Um, but at the time, with those thousand or so studies of BPA, there were only two looking at BPS. And they both used very outdated uh, tests to, to look for safety. So I actually raised money. I got the money to one of the lead scientists working on B BPA toxicity. And she, uh, Cheryl Watson, repeated the work she had done with BPA, with BPS, and found that it basically works the same way. So the two principal molecules used in thermal receipt paper have been BPA and BPS, mm. functionally the same, toxicologically virtually identical. So, so I, I, I spoke with Amy the other day, and she and was she telling me that, that there are um, 30 studies on BPS and, of course, thousands, like you were saying, on BPA. Can you tell me a little bit about BPS? Because BPS is what Target specifically coats on their receipt papers. And we also know through a national study from an NGO that was released this year, you can look it up on Momovation and link to them, um, that the vast majority of the brands out there, these national brands, are using BPS on their thermal receipt paper. So, you know, it's a big issue. And, you know, we're really concerned about BPS, just like you said, because it's like a sister chemical, right? She's a younger sister chemical. She seems to be a little worse, a little nastier. Can you tell me um, what kind of things it's been linked to? Well, it's linked to behavioral. In mice, there have been hardly any uh, epidemiological studies of people and BPS because the issue is so new. But when you do the same studies you do with BPA, when you do them with BPS, and the numbers are growing you find problems pretty much the same as BPA. Changes in the ways that mother mice behave, for example. This just came out. They're, they aren't as, as good as unexposed animals at nursing their young. 
There are changes in uh, glucose metabolism that's related to insulin. There are changes in uh, neurodevelopmental issues. So it's every, every time a, a serious independent scientist has looked at the consequences of BPA and compared it to BPS, uh, to the BP, looked at BPS and compared it to BPA, they found problems. And that's a good that's a good point. And so essentially, uh, I'm going to explain to everyone at home. We we refer to this as regrettable substitution. So this is when they kind of replace one chemical with a sister chemical that would be in the same family, which is why I call them the bitchy bisphenols. They're sisters, right? And so the younger sister hasn't been noticed. Now she's starting to get a lot of attention, or getting a little bit of attention. She's getting quote unquote these lab fans, right? That I'm talking. These scientists are starting to look at her. But as they're looking at her, they're discovering that she's very similar to her sister. So the question here is, do we really need to wait another 10 years or five years or however long it's going to take to get thousands of studies? Or do we just remove this today? Do we just remove the bisphenol, the entire family, just call the family rotten, just quite like what they are, they're rotten? Or do we leave them in? Um, we have people chiming in in the chat room saying they had no idea about BPS. And, you know, of course, thank you, Pete, for for um, telling us about it. So I have a question. Um, so we've already been out with this petition and already we've gotten some people from the chemical industry coming in and chiming in and saying the levels that, you know, you're getting on your hands are not significant and you shouldn't be worried about it. And it's like homeopathy and, you know, they're going on and on about that. I would love for you to discuss a little bit and educate the audience about how small amounts matter and what your, your opinion is on what the chemical industry has to say. It, my opinion is quite simple. They're wrong. The amounts that are on BPA and uh, the amounts of BPA and BPS on thermal paper are sufficient to raise your serum levels into amounts that all evidence from independent science says are dangerous. So uh, there, th yes, of course there are industry representatives challenging this, but it doesn't withstand scrutiny if you're familiar with the academic studies. So if there here's a question for the group, okay? And, yeah. and you, you can send Leah, uh, your, Leah your answers. Um, if, if you imagine one drop of water whose concentration of BPS is one part per billion, okay? How many molecules of BPS do you think are in that one drop? How many Ooh. molecules of BPS? I, ooh, so, well, I think people are chiming in a little bit to say. Who, um, who out there remembers Avogadro's number? Nobody, I don't think anybody knows that. Why don't you tell us? A basic number out of, out of chemistry, but bottom line, uh, I, I asked some some chemists to do that calculation for me uh, to confirm. It's over over two quadrillion molecules of BPA or BPS in that one drop of water. And when you have molecules that are capable of stimulating hormone receptors, one molecule can stimulate a hormone receptor, and then the the the, the action of that receptor being stimulated can be amplified by hormone, hormonal mechanisms by 5,000 to 10,000 fold. Uh, over two trillion, two quadrillion molecules can cause a lot of damage in one drop at one part per billion. So the, the, the whole notion that these are low doses is false. Can you talk a little bit about um, hormone disruption at small levels in general, and maybe a little bit about, you know, what you've taught me about large doses versus small doses. Sure. Um, when you think about dosing and doses, what you have to bear in mind is that the body is extremely sensitive to hormones. It has to be. There are lots of chemical signals racing through your bloodstream, racing into your cells, into your tissues that are sending signals that are absolutely crucial to development. To development and also governing day-to-day -day things. 
but especially important in development because they control the developmental tape. Um, they control when genes are turned on and off. And they, 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 are, they are the difference between having a functional brain and a dysfunctional brain. They are the difference between having all your inner organs working and having one or more fail. They are the difference between being cancer free and having cancer. They make that difference. So hormones work at really low doses, parts per trillion to parts per billion in the bloodstream. Uh, uh, hormone like chemicals are no different. They also work at those very low levels. Let me, here's, a, here's a question. You think a part per billion, I've already indicated a part per billion actually is a lot of molecules. Well, think about this. Think about Cialis. Oh. Okay, Cialis is a drug that guys take when they have erectile dysfunction, right? Right. What do you think the serum concentration of, sex, of Cialis is when it's working well? Oh, it's about 40 parts per billion parts per billion in your serum. And it has big effects. And sometimes it has side effects that include days of blindness. If you read the, the documents giving you warning about side effects. So small amounts of chemicals that interfere with hormone signaling. Um, what appear to be small amounts, but really are physiologically very meaningful. They can have big effects. Wow. So what you're essentially telling me is it's kind of silly the way they're saying that small amounts don't matter when in pharmacology and when we're actually taking drugs, they are using things at parts per billion as well. And it seems to be having an effect. So why are we ignoring things like bisphenols at parts it, per billion? It's entirely reasonable to think that some molecules will not have effects at these levels. But we now know that bisphenol A and bisphenol S do. They behave like hormones. So let's not listen to silly arguments trying to claim that there's no effect. It's silly. Right. It now, is. you asked me about high doses versus low doses. Yes, yes. And again, bear in mind, a low dose is physiologically can be very important, very impactful. Low dose in the part, in the part per billion range. Here's the problem. All all testing for chemical danger is done at high doses by the regulatory agencies or the companies that are providing data to those agencies. And the problem with that is that low doses can do something very different from what high doses do. It can have effects that are not evidenced that, that don't show up at high doses. I'll give you an example. Again, from a, a, a drug, um, that's been that because it's a drug, it undergoes a different regimen of testing yeah. than, than chemicals that are used like BPA. So think of tamoxifen. Do you know what tamoxifen is? A breast cancer drug. It's a drug used to treat breast cancer. At high doses, tamoxifen suppresses the growth of breast cancer tumors. At low doses, doses way beneath what a, a regulatory agency would test for if it was just testing for toxicity. At low doses, it causes it, uh, growth of the tumor. So high doses cause tumor shrinkage, low doses cause tumor expansion. And the way that the regulatory tests work is they, they so they start up at a high dose. They then work down the dose response curve until they, they don't see an effect. And they think, okay, we're fine. Anything beneath that level is fine, but we'll be even better. We'll, we, will, we will use some safety factors, safety factors that take into account that babies aren't just little adults and rats aren't just little people. And, and actually there's a 50 to 100 fold difference across people in how sensitive they are to various uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals. So um, you go down, if you actually test at the level that is calculated to be safe using those safety factors, you reach what's called the no observed adverse effect level, where there's no significant difference between the uh, uh, control and experimental. Then you add those safety factors, you take it way down. It turns out that that dose causes, is, is sufficient to cause growth of the breast cancer tumor. Okay, so high doses, no, you, you get suppression. Low doses, you get growth. 
but the fit, the regulatory testing never tested the low doses. So they don't see it when you have these different effects. There are different mechanisms being set in uh, motion by doses at different levels. That's one of the, the amazing things about hormones, which is now well established in the field of endocrinology, well established. And anyone who denies that either uh, is purposely misrepresenting the truth or doesn't understand the science of hormones and the chronology. The, the, the most important thing is to understand that regulatory tests, are, as they are currently conducted and as they have been conducted for the last century or more, are based upon a false assumption that high-dose testing can show low-dose results. That's not true. There's lots of science that uh, establishes that. It comes out of endocrinology. You learn that hormones do different things at different doses in endocrinology 101. And anyone who challenges this, uh, this scientific fact is either unfamiliar with endocrinology or misrepresenting the truth. Now, let me, let me say this. I, I, I meant to say this much earlier. Target is very much aware of the field of green chemistry, and they're really trying to do a good job. Um, that's why I think it, it makes sense to respectfully request them to make this change. If they understood the, the consequences of having their customer base exposed to bisphenol A and bisphenol S by the use of thermal receipts, I think they would make that change as quickly as possible. And it's possible because there are alternatives. And why use paper receipts in the first place? Use electronic receipts. But tar so Target can do this. And there are people at Target who understand this science. So there's something really interesting. Um, I went by Best Buy, and Best Buy uses that alternative Pergafast thermal receipt paper that doesn't have bisphenols in it. But what was even more interesting about the fact that they don't use bisphenols in their receipt paper was their their um, receipt like uh, what, what was happening. You come up to the console and the console asks you, do you want a receipt or not? So you can at that point say, no, I don't want a receipt. And then if you do want a receipt, it asks you, do you want an email receipt or do you want a regular receipt? And so you can click on email receipt. And then at that point, then it asks you, do you want to opt in or opt out of our marketing? So they have that even that third step of asking you, do you even want emails from us now that we've got your information? And I was like, thank you, Best Buy. That's amazing. So um, I really like how Best Buy does it. We put that in our video as a great example of what the consumers would really appreciate. I think that's exactly what Best Buy should do. Offer no receipts, Target. a digital receipt. Target. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, is what Target should do. Offer no receipts, a digital receipt, and then allow you to opt out of their marketing. And then if you want a receipt, because you're old school for whatever reason, they're handing you receipt paper that's um, that doesn't have bisphenols on it. Now, I don't know a lot about Pergafast, but what I have heard from Safer Chemicals is whatever the additives are that are in that paper, they're not coming off as much on the hand or it's not creating as much as a situation. So we'll have to look into that. But for now, I would say it's bisphenol free. Do you have any... Um, do you have any like thoughts on that topic, Pete? I don't know Target Best. I don't. I don't know what's known about it, and so I really am not in a position to be able to respond to that. That's actually good. Um, so we we do too. We just need to look into more of the options. So there's also I do know that there's another option for receipt paper that has vitamin C on it, and I do know that that one has been a little problematic. I've heard that that one's been a little problematic with the additional additives that are in the receipt paper. So it's not just vitamin C, it's other things. But what we did do on momovation.com is we listed all of the options. So all of the options that they had um, from them based on a report from um, Green America, they looked into this there with their, um, they have a similar campaign going on, non focusing on Target, but just focusing on all the national stores, asking them to stop giving receipts in general, because of course, you know, they believe that it's killing trees. And if I was reading up on, you know, how many, um, how much paper is used in, in just in thermal receipts and receipts in general every year was just astounding. So, you know, I'm with you on the no receipt would be the best. And we're going digital anyways. So I think it's just going to be a matter of time before they start, they just stop giving you receipts because yeah, this is old. In the meantime, if you are offered a receipt and you need a receipt, 
for reporting expenses or something like that, take a picture of it. My, we got, my organization now accepts photographs of receipts if we're, we're in a, unavoidably forced to encounter a receipt, which is potentially BPA or BPS. Just take a picture of it. You know, there's additional applications we've that we've linked up on momovation.com. You can go in and I think we gave you about six different mobile phone apps that you can download and they help you take the re- the picture of the receipts and it helps you organize all of your expenses, which, which was pretty cool. Some of them are paid for, most of them are free, but what Pete is saying is absolutely true. I mean, taking a picture of your receipt um, should be fine if you need it for, for your own um, purpose. Purposes. So, Pete, um, you were talking a- again about how small amounts matter and, and bisphenols. Can you talk a little bit about what types of issues and what type of diseases and symptoms have been linked with bisphenols, that chemical class? Yeah. Uh, now, um, what I'm about to do is summarize a series of studies carried out by independent academic scientists based at universities using tools that have been developed over the last 20 years as a result of funding by the National Institutes of Health. So these are really advanced approaches to to determining what is safe and what is not. Um, The regulatory agencies, in addition to using that that flawed assumption that I mentioned before, they depend upon really old tests, tests that have been around in in one case since 1935, um, that are extremely simplistic. They don't uh, uncover some of the the worst um, uh, impacts of bisphenols uh, or other chemicals because they're they're so antiquated. In fact, if you think about the way those tests work and you think for a moment about the following metaphor, um, so I suspect most people listening to this have seen pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope, those beautiful galaxies that are far away. Those are discovered using 20th, late 20th century science. Wow. The, and the metaphor is this. Um, the way the FDA and the EPA test for uh, hazard is analogous to walking outside in your backyard with binoculars and looking for those galaxies. You don't see them because you're using antiquated tools. You have to use modern tools, and it's modern tools that drive modern medicine. So if you want to take advantage of the the amazing discoveries of modern medicine that have unfolded over the last 50 years, use the approaches that those scientists have used instead of things that were designed in the mid-1900s. So they're using antiquated methodology, science, testing, to look into these things. So uh, can you talk a little bit about the FD level, FDA levels in general? And I did notice that the European Union just recently banned BPA and thermal receipt paper. So obviously Europe, their levels are far lower. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you think the FDA has levels as high as they have? Well, it, it, there's no argument about that. They're depending upon uh, flawed assumptions and flawed and outdated tests. They aren't up to snuff. Um, they have recently participated with the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences to, in, in a really uh, wonderfully intended large-scale experiment called Clarity, uh, which costs on the order of $15 million, in which they decided that they were going to try and very directly ask the question, why are academic scientists using these modern tests seeing things where we and industry can't see what what these academics are finding. So what they did was they um, set up an audacious experiment where the FDA raised uh, thousands of animals using what are called good laboratory practices, or at least they were supposed to be raised using good laboratory practices, but there's some kinks in the way it actually played out. And they did their old tests and they, they farmed out a bunch of the animals to academic scientists to perform with animals. They provided uh, those academics, the um, scientists at universities, uh, with animals that that the FDA had raised. 
and they said, okay, here, you do your tests. We'll do ours and we'll compare the results. Not everything is in. Um, the FDA has, uh, and NIH, the NIEHS, the, not, and the, uh, the, what's called the NTP, the, uh, the National Toxicology Program at NIH, NIEHS, um, they released, they, they released uh, a draft report based upon a, an analysis they had finished on their, using their standard approaches. In the meantime, the academic scientists uh, have begun to publish their studies. Um, and here's what's, what they're finding. The, NI, the, the FDA, in its summary, said, see, we don't see anything. Everything's safe. The academic scientists are finding impacts. And they also have taken the, the uh, unusual step of analyzing the FDA data, which is now public. Anyone can analyze it. And they're finding that the FDA has low dose effects in the data that the FDA said had no effects. What? And the reason is because the FDA decided, well, if there are only low dose effects, it doesn't matter. It's not biologically significant. In other words, they're following the classic assumption of regulatory toxicology that high dose testing predicts low dose results. And yet it's staring at them in the face. They have low dose effects in the data they have released. So they're just basically ignoring it. Yeah. Yes, they are. There will be studies uh, of the, these data coming out uh, later this year by independent scientists who have gone ahead and done the analysis. There are other problems. For example, um, in the pilot study leading up to this major thing, um, the FDA discovered after the fact that their control animals had been contaminated by BPA. Okay, at levels comparable to what you what was seen in the experimental animals. So contaminated controls means you, your, your experiment is flawed. It is flawed. It's failed. Okay. So how does this work and in so government? I mean, like, I can't even, like, imagine. Even though they, they never identified the source of the contamination, they went ahead with a big study, and they didn't measure for contamination. So the, the, the assumption right now is that those... This, the, the big study is also has contaminated controls, but the FDA did not make the crucial measurements to determine whether or not that was the case. There are many ex, there are many flaws in the way the ex, the FDA executed the raising of the animals and the sending of the animals to the the independent scientists. And this will all come out. This is shocking, Pete. It is shocking. I mean this is absolutely shocking. I mean, it, it just, it, I mean, okay, so Carrie Gillum, of course, as you know, uh, the, the author of Whitewashing, which is, you know, a journalistic uh, study kind of looking at glyphosate and the history of glyphosate. Um, they've been working a lot with um, uh, FOI, FOI requests to the FDA and all those things. Those are Freedom of Information Act. And what they have found is a lot of collusion. Um, they found um, a lot of, uh, you know, people from industry, ghostwriting, you know, papers, ghostwriting all kinds of things, you know, uh, in, in duly influencing people at government levels. And then you've got the whole revolving door of people. And the thing is, is I remember I used to work for the government and this was way before, you know, I did social media. But I even remember when I worked for the California State Assembly, you didn't piss off the the lobbyists because you potentially could be one of them one day and you wanted that job because the job at government set you up for the big job making big bucks so you didn't piss those people off you were nice to them it was a really revolving door and it's a revolving door of you know you know hi how are you doing come on in and i remember that i was on the other side so so some of you who don't know i used to be a lot different uh 15 years ago um and I worked for politicians who were anti-environment. And so I would sit across the table from people like Pete who were explaining science to me. They had to get through me to get to my elected official, to get to the member. And I would scribble some things down, roll my eyes and shuffle them out the door. Today, my life is very different, obviously. But I remember what it was like to be someone who worked in government back then. And I remember the feelings of indebtedness towards these lobbyists and these business people that working 
happening around me because I didn't want this job forever. I was making nothing. I was making chump change. Okay, it was a really exciting job, but it's not something that you can raise a family with. In the future, you know, we had plans of working with them and working for these other companies. And so it's it's it, it kind of makes sense if you think about it in terms of that. But the FDA as well, you know, do you feel, I mean, I don't know if you feel comfortable, Pete, but do you feel at the FDA and the EPA that, you know, there's some funny business going on? Is there is there any kind of thing that you can say about that just in general? How well, do you feel about that? You know, um, first of all, Carrie Gillum's book and other a series of books um, document uh, extensive interplay between industry and both EPA and the and in those cases the, F, the EPA not the FDA um, the FDA has was FOIAed F I F I O FOIA Freedom of Information Act request FOIA yeah independent journalists yeah. On the study I'm talking about, and almost all any paper that came back was too heavily redacted to be useful. Whoa! Um, and it takes money to pursue uh, th those actions to force the FDA to provide unredacted material. So that that pathway right now is closed, although there are people thinking about it. But I can tell you one example. Um, I was meeting with the FDA, a scientist, um, in anticipation of releasing a large uh, review in Endocrine Reviews, which is the, um, the biggest journal of the Endocrine Society, which is the world's professional association of endocrinologists, both physicians and, and research scientists. So we had this paper coming out in Endocrine Reviews, specifically on that low-dose, high-dose issue, which is called non-monotonicity. And if I slip into saying non-monotonicity, um, I apologize, but that, that's in essence describing the fact that low doses do different things than high doses. Okay. So I was meeting uh, one of these FDA scientists um, in Washington, D.C., and I explained our concerns about non-monotonicity, the low dose, high dose thing. And she looks at me and she, she says, we don't see those results. And I said, of course you don't. You don't test at those levels. And she thought about it. And she said, you're right. Ten minutes later, she was repeating to other people, we don't see those, those results. Well, we went ahead and we published the paper. A bunch of stuff happened because of it. Uh, that battle's not over. It's still underway. Europe, uh, actually, it, several European agencies have confirmed the reality of non-monotonicity now. But that scientist now works for a law firm earning at least 10 times what she earned for the FDA. Yeah. Um, defending products like EPA. Right. So we know the revolving door exists. I've seen one very, one example very up close. Um, I'm sure it's not the only one. We don't know what's going on now. It's an, I mean, it is such an issue. It really is. It's almost like, you know, you want a firewall in between the two. Um, and I don't know how to solve that problem. Well, there are examples of ways that can be approached where uh, there's something called the Health Effects Institute, which was set up by the automotive industry in collaboration with public health officials. So car companies and others began putting serious money into the Health Effects Institute. But the governance of who did the research and how it was published was completely out of their control. So it, it is possible to do. Um, another factoid, no, actually, it's, it's real news, not fake news. Um, the last estimate I saw in terms of the, the revenue generated by sales of BPA was something, and this was worldwide uh, maybe five, seven years ago, $750,000 an hour. An hour? An hour. Oh, my goodness. There's a lot. That, that pays for a lot of lawyers to defend the product. $750,000 an hour is what the bisphenol industry is making as of five years ago. Yeah, yeah. I, it's roughly five years ago. And, wow. and they, they were anticipating exponential growth. We could pay off my house. I mean, hey, let's all pool together. <laughs> we'll need, let's get 10 hours. Let's pool us, everyone in the chat room together. Let's just pay off our house, right? <laughs> I mean, that would be really possible. Well, that, that is... It pays not just for lawyers, but it pays for fake organizations like the 
American Council for Science and Health, which is a total, it, it, which misrepresents the science protecting uh, chemical products. Yeah, yeah, this is, and do do these uh, these associations as well, do they donate politically, do you know? Um, are, are they just American communication? The Chemistry Council, which is the trade organization of the chemical industry in the United States, uh, definitely donates large sums of money to politicians. And uh, they probably give to both sides, which is kind of... Well, if I were they, I would. Yeah, yeah, I remember that going on. They would give to both sides. Not always equally, but they would give to both sides. It would basically, wh whatever runner was going to win was who would get the most money. <laughs> <laughs> whatever they assumed i you know, this is just you know okay so you know what the thing with thermal receipt paper because i'm going to direct it back for the audience to be able to connect these pieces so essentially this is allowed to happen because the fda says that the the rate the levels that people are exposed to are completely fine so as pete just you know told you and now you understand that those levels are based on outdated methodology outdated testing testing that's like ancient and they're not even looking into potential impacts at low dose levels so yes it is low dose levels, it's low dose levels. But when it comes to hormone disrupting chemicals, it doesn't take much to make an impact that you can't anticipate at a high level. So when it comes to thermal receipt paper, this is in powder form, it's coming off on your hands, it's getting into your bloodstream, you are now affected. We know also that when you're handling receipts, the amount of bisphenols in your bloodstream go up. So we have a problem here. So it's not quite like um, you know bottles and cans where you a chemical reaction happens has to happen in order for you to get that BPA into food into your system. This is just powder. We're just getting it onto our hands. So it's a lot easier. There's a lot more. I believe it was Green America that had a study that they were saying that the amount of bisphenols you are um, contaminated with in thermal receipt paper versus canned food is up to a thousand times more. So this is significant. This is very significant. We have national brands all over the United States that are using this thermal receipt paper. Contaminating the, contaminating the general public. And we have one company, th uh, Target, who we are petitioning because the vast majority of Momovation community members shop at this store. And one of the reasons why we shop at Target is because, hey, they do have a chemical policy. They are bringing in more safer products. You walk up and down the aisles, you're starting to see safer personal care products. You're seeing non-GMO organic food. You're starting to see the things that you want to see there, which is why I know, ladies, is why you're shopping there. So it's not at the end of the day, it's not that we don't like Target. We're consumers there. We just don't want to be exposed anymore. And we don't want our brothers and sisters to be exposed either. Now, Target has millions of consumers across the United States and actually globally. There's people who've been chiming in from Australia and from Europe that also shop at Target. And they're very concerned as well, asking me if it's the same thermal receipt paper. They're telling me that it's also shiny. So I'm also probably going to assume they might be right. It might be the same exact paper. So what are we trying to do here in Momovation? What is the point of all this? The point is we want Target to change. We want Target to change to offer digital receipts. We want them to reformulate to uh, uh, bisphenol free receipt paper. We don't want BPA and we don't want BPS. We don't want any of the bisphenol family in that receipt paper at all. We want to be able to go to target and not have to worry about wearing gloves, having to do, you know, weird things when you're trying to sign, you know, um, that paper. We want to be able to not worry about the health of our family. And we also primarily are concerned with the cash registers who are handling 200, 300, 400 of these thermal receipt papers per day, which is definitely exceeding the limits in the European Union, that's for sure. Um, and, and we're very concerned. This is something that doesn't need to happen. I really believe that it's a, a, it's a change that can happen probably very quickly. Also, I just wanted to let you know, Pete, that uh, Trader Joe's has also announced that they will be reformulating to bisphenol free receipt paper. And last weekend when I went to Trader Joe's, their receipt paper had already changed and they didn't know why, you know, the cash registers don't understand what's going on. The managers of the store don't know what's going on. I walk in asking them and they're just like, what's going on here? I've never even heard of this. And I'm like pulling up the Bloomberg report and showing them and they're like, oh my God. And then talking to them about bisphenols and then they're like, thank you. 
<laughs> you know, because you can see the wheels turning in their head. I had no idea about this. And how many thousands and thousands and thousands of these pieces of paper have I been handling? So um, can you talk a little bit, Pete, about the most vulnerable people handling receipt paper right now? Well, clearly the people who handle it all the time are being exposed. And there have been some studies, uh, a, a small number of studies, looking at uh, BPA levels in um, in cash register uh, operators. And they're, they, they, have, they tend to have higher levels. There also have been studies that um, are beginning to look at some of the physiological consequences. Um, Call from one, and, two, and they, uh, um, two, two, sorry, that's my two, phone. Eight, that's amazing. Um, yeah. We still love it. <laughs> anyway, the, um, the people are beginning to look at this very carefully. That's amazing. I'm now up levels that are harmful, and they're now finding some physiological effects that are, are gain, that are indicative of harm. So the most the person that you would be primarily concerned with, like as in the most vulnerable person at Target, would be a pregnant woman cash register. I saw. Someone uh, like I, I would also, but I can't tell you how many times when I'm in a in a store uh, and I'm watching the behavior of customers. Here's someone who's trying to juggle the receipt and the papers. Uh, and, excuse me, the, the papers and the, and the what they purchased. They often put it in their mouth. Yes, you're right. I've done that before. And, and that is a great way to inject yourself with BPA. Or using it to blot your lipstick. I've yeah, done then, that as well. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And then the, there's another usage pattern, which at one level sounds funny, but really isn't. I was lecturing about this at a college in Pennsylvania a few years back. And a student, um, a boy, a guy, uh, raises his hand and he says, Dr. Myers, um, sometimes I burn those papers. Is, is that going to be a problem? And I'm imagining this pile of papers and he's having fun lighting them. And I'm thinking, well, look, just don't breathe in the smoke. And another young man sticks his hand up and says, uh -uh, you don't understand. He rolls his joints with those papers. And that's going to be an issue in Washington, California, Colorado, yeah. pretty much all over the United yeah. States. And, and I actually uh, then went online to... Uh, investigate whether there was any indication of this being a widespread pattern. And there was actually, at the time, there was a lively debate underway. Uh, if you Google joint and and uh, thermal paper receipt or some other variation of thermal receipt paper, um, you'll find that there, they, were, they were then debating uh, whether or not it was safe. And their conclusion was it's safe as long as there's no ink on the paper which reflects the fact they don't understand the technology that drives the use of the paper, which is, right. the, as I said earlier, it's coated as dust on the paper. There's no ink involved in the, in the printing process. Oh my gosh. That's just, I mean, <laughs> I, I, okay, ladies, um, pregnant women, children, cash registers, us, can you tell them also that little that little bit about um, alcohol-based antibacterial gel on your hands? Yeah, that's, um, that's worked by Fred Vomsall, Dr. Vomsall at University of Missouri, where he had people handle thermal receipts and then measured what was in their blood and their urine. Um, and he found that the amount that was in them was amplified by having uh, skin sanitizers uh, on their skin. And that's and because- those Skin sanitizers, uh, have ingredients that are designed to help uh, penetrate the skin. And so that, that basically, as it was entering the skin, it was bringing more bisphenol A in. Wow. Wow. Just shocking. Okay. Um, you. I, I just wanted to say, Pete, I know you can't really see, but there is a lot of people who've been chiming in and, you know, uh, questions like based on what else are they not telling us, you know, um, things like, 
oh my gosh, this is so messed up. Um, we've got, uh, you know, Jennifer here chiming in, go figure, the FDA doesn't tell all. Um, people are just, you know, <laughs> and other people chiming in, telling the bisphenol industry, I need a house, so you can pay for that with your $750,000 an hour, which is more. I, I should mention something that's free. Um, Environmental Health Sciences, which I founded uh, almost 20 years ago, publishes a daily newsletter called Environmental Health News. It's free, ehn.org, and you can you can read about the science and related stuff. It, the 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 what we do is we aggregate news from mainstream media around the world, and then we have some reporters who also report on stuff that's not being carried by mainstream press. And it comes to you one email a day. It's free. There's nothing like it. So, and he's absolutely right. Uh, this this newsletter that you get, it's called Above the Fold, ladies. And I get it daily at 5 a.m. California time. This is how I stay up to date on all of the news that have to do with environmental health, um, climate change, all of those other things that are that are sciency that have that that are going to be impacting our future. I would highly recommend you going to ehn.org and signing up for that newsletter. Absolutely, absolutely, sign up. Um, Every Thursday, there's a second newsletter that's about kids' health, kids' environmental health, and on Friday, there's another one about energy and health. So. Uh, there's lots of good information coming out from environmental health sciences. Yeah. And, and, and that's all because of Pete. We have a lot to thank you for. And I know Pete is really humble. And so what he's going to do is he's going to tell me, no, no, I was not the only one. But him and Theo Colborn, God rest her soul, she's um, passed away two years ago. The two of them organized this entire scientific industry from the ground up. There are many contributors. There's many contributors. See, I told you he's going to be exciting. humble. And the exciting thing about it, the reason why this science works is instead of sticking with old ideas and old approaches, scientists co have come in from lots of different fields that initially had nothing to do with toxicology, many of them because they were surprised in their labs by a result they didn't expect. They then backtracked, figured out what had caused that result, and they learned, for example, that BPA was changing the development of baby mice when exposed in the womb. And so these, these this, wonderful family of scientists now from many different fields work together collectively to solve this, to identify what the problems are and develop solutions. So we are really honored to have you here at Momovation, Pete. And I'll never, ever, ever stop singing your praises because we're really honored to be able to have someone like you to help us kind of bring all of the science together and help communicate it to the audience, help communicate it to me. Seriously, like Melissa just said, God bless you, Pete and Leah. Thank you so much. Um, we, we really, really appreciate you. And I don't know what we would do without you. We definitely would not be doing this, this petition to Target without you, Pete. So we're really, really, really happy to have you. So ladies, we're going to wrap it up right now because we're running out of time. I wanted to say, please go to momovation.com, read more information about the petition. You can, there's a link right on the front page. You can't miss it. Share this with your friends, your family. We need to educate people about the thermal receipt issue. We need to get um, more signatures. The last I just checked, we have over 15,000 signatures to the petition to Target, asking them to reformulate their receipt paper and offer digital receipts. Um, this is an absolute dynamic brand. I know they are listening. Yes, Pete, you had something to say. I just want to reiterate what I said earlier. Target is really trying to do the right thing. They need some help in pushing this decision past the goal line. But they are really trying to do the, great, the, the right thing with respect to the chemical chemistry in their products. So you can thank them also. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we will be ecstatic once they decide to do this. I mean, because this is going to be, and, and Target has a safer chemicals policy. They're already starting to restrict things like fire retardants and parabens and phthalates. So this is something that I absolutely believe that they will do. They We just need to show them that there is 
people out there and a lot of people who want them to make this change and want them to make this change pretty quickly. So I, I do think that because I think they're a dynamic brand that they're going to go ahead and do this, they're absolutely going to do the right thing. And they're going to be a national model about what to do and, and you know, how to protect their customers. I'm going to give you the final word, Pete, if you have one. I'm <laughs> thankful to you, Leah, for assembling a wonderful community uh, under the umbrella of Malovation, we need to reach uh, this community. And your Thank computer you. is about to freeze again. Okay, I'm back. Well, guys, my computer is about to freeze again. I love you so much. Thank you for joining us. Sorry about the, the two switching around. Um, but I really needed you to get this information. I needed you to get it from the horse's mouth, from Pete himself. So again, thank you, Pete. Thank you, Momovation community. And continue to share that petition, ladies. Tomorrow we will be tweeting and Facebooking at, at um, Target. And Monday is the IRL day. So we're going to march into Target on Monday and hand them a letter saying, we want you to reformulate this receipt paper. We're concerned about our health of our families and all the people in our community. Community. We need you to do the right thing. So Thursday is tweeting and Facebooking and Monday is showing up on the store. I love you ladies. Have a great week. Thanks so much for your help. Bye.